Okay, uh, let's get us started. Um, so the plan for today is to um, discuss model compression, um, which is basically a continuation uh, about the hardware uh, layer uh, of the stack, of the machine learning uh, system stack. Um, and, and the key idea is that how we could uh, use um, some of the insights um, either uh, from the mathematics of machine learning. Um, essentially, that was uh, some of the earlier work uh, even before 2000 uh, by Lan Yukon. Uh, and, and recently based on the capabilities that we get uh, from different uh, macro architectures, some uh, different new uh, ML based hardware accelerators um, and, and how we could uh, compress um, a deep neural network uh, in this case, um, in order to make it um, more efficient uh, in terms of storage. First of all, we, we have large models. It has a lot of weights, um, either like the um, fully connected ones or the uh, convolutional ones. Um, they have lots of uh, weights um, um, and obviously they do a lot of calculation, um, how we could um, decrease the size of it and decrease the, the number of calculation that, that we do in these um, networks. That's basically the topic we want to cover now. Uh, before we start, do you have any question? Um, about the topic, about what we have discussed or about your project? How's it going with your project? Is everything fine? No concern or anything? Okay, um, sounds good. So basically the idea is to reduce um, the size, um, the size of such uh, a network. Uh, and, and as a result, when we uh, reduce the number of weights, um, not only the size will decrease, but also the, um, the computation uh, of this network, um, especially when they do inference. And by now, uh, I hope that um, since we discussed this many, many times throughout this course, um, now you exactly uh, get what I mean, right? Um, when we um, say computation, we care about multiple aspects, uh, boils down the number of uh, floating point operations, uh, but as a result, um, the energy consumption and, and so on. So we typically talk about um, multiple objectives uh, of such systems. Um, so um, there are basically um, this area of model compression um, that boils down to pruning approaches uh, as well as quantization approaches. Um, so you can consider this um, pruning and quantization, and we will talk about both um, today. The key difference is that um, in pruning, like if you imagine neural network as a tree, you want to cut some of these branches. Uh, quantization is, is with respect to the representation of, uh, uh, of the numbers that we consider for the weights, uh, or um, or the activation as well. Um, and toward the end, I will discuss also it has some implication or relevance to your project and uh, Athena um, uh, that, that you can think about it. It is, it is interesting how, how, uh, how these stuff could be connected uh, to um, Adversary machine learning as well. 
So again, uh, pruning, um, right, you can consider uh, your neural network, um, right, it has a um, connection uh, uh, or architecture like this. This is, as you know, as you see, uh, this is somehow fully connected network uh, that it has some activations uh, from different layers and some weights associated to these connections. Um, and by pruning, you could consider um, both, right? Pruning these um, weights uh, or synapses, you could consider as well as pruning these uh, neurons, um, these circuits, right? Um, and you can think about it, some of the connection, uh, right? Uh, it is somehow intuitive. Some of the connection might be very weak. Um, so if the connection, so for example, if this connection were, were here, it very close to zero, it's very, this means that it's very weak. Uh, it doesn't influence um, the uh, activation for this uh, node, right? For this unit, um, why you want to um, basically um, pay for its storage, right? Um, that's that's a kind of intuition behind pruning. Um, typically, um, after you train the network, um, as we discussed previously, uh, a lot of these weights are very small uh, and we want to get rid of them because they don't influence the activation much. And also when, when you cut out all of the uh, weights toward an activation, you may want to get rid of the nodes as well, the units as well, um, basically these neurons. Um, so you don't want to represent them in your uh, uh, feature map um, and, and they, they get, um, um, you need to store them as a result, so you want to get rid of them. So you can think about it uh, um, in both aspects. So and this is how, how this will uh, would look like um, after, after the pruning. Um, this is um, basically this approach, um, having a um, three step. Um, if you look at all uh, uh, publications or active research, and again, this area is one of the uh, hottest area in machine learning research. Uh, people look at this um, and come up with some innovative and interesting solution. Um, but you could, you could think about this uh, pruning as a uh, three-step, uh, high-level three-step approach, right? So you start uh, by training uh, your network, right? This is obvious. And then you want to prune some of the connections um, however you want. Typically, you want to have a threshold, um, whatever weights below this threshold, you prune them away. Um, so if you prune these weights, um, obviously um, you can use that, like you can use the prune network, um, but just cutting uh, for your inference, but you, typically in those cases, the accuracy would drop. So you need to do some uh, retraining again. Um, after you cut out some of these connections or neurons, and, and um, here you can you can see the results, right? This is this is the case um, that uh, you you basically you prune your connections. Um, this particle and this particle with two different uh, uh, regularizer, right? With L1 and L2 regularizer, um, you you prune your network and do uh, the inference uh, or uh, measure its accuracy uh, right away without any retraining. And you see that uh, it has start to 
um, to lose um, some accuracy uh, very quickly um, after you af after you um, you go beyond this 50% uh, threshold. This, uh, this percentage on the x-axis shows the percentage of, um, of the weights that uh, you prune the way. And you see that uh, around 80 uh, with respect to this uh, particular L2 regularization, uh, it, once you prune 80% of your weights, you lose roughly around 5% of accuracy which is um, not something you want to do, right? Um, so typically um, you need to do some retraining um, and the key idea is very simple, right? Um, so you, you first train your network um, and then prune um, some of your um, connection um, based on a particular thing, right? And you know exactly uh, what are the connections that you prune the way. Once you know uh, where they are, then you can retrain the network, uh, not allowing those connections uh, to basically, uh, you put them, you force them to zero, right? This is the way how you do that. You don't let them to change uh, during the training, during the stochastic gradient descent, right? In, in your stochastic gradient descent, you update the weights. So you need to uh, change your optimization, not allowing a specific weights to get updated as a result, right? Um, this is typically how, how these approaches work. You force um, a specific weight not to change. Uh, only you allow certain part of your uh, your connections uh, to change um, their um, their number, right? Their rates. Um, so after you do this retraining, you see that uh, you can uh, go beyond ninety percent and uh, lose um, lose just. So for example, in this case, you can you can prune ninety percent of the weights and lose 1.5 percent of your accuracy right um, so with retraining um, you have much more chance uh, to, um, to to not losing any any sort of accuracy um, and, and even uh, this red line uh, shows that if you do this iteratively not in one step, uh, maybe you do multiple pruning, uh, retraining, pruning, retraining, pruning, retraining, um, then you can do much, much better, right? So even with 90%, you see that um, you preserve all of your accuracy, nothing has, has lost. Um, so basically meaning that your, uh, 90% of the weights were useless somehow. <laughs> uh, you get the same accuracy as your original model. Um, do you have any question about this? And this result for, for this particular paper, learning both weights and connection in efficient neural networks, uh, one of those. Uh, um, earlier papers in new generation of model compression and pruning. Um, so if you look at um, the uh, weights uh, from two aspects, right? So this, this particle is, um, pruning AlexNet um, and the y-axis in the first diagram shows um, the um, percentage of uh, the weights um, um, for all um, layers of, of your network. You know that like the earlier layer or conf layer, 
and the later part of your network is for classification, fully connected layers. Um, and this is, um, this shows the total number of weights. Uh, you see that uh, roughly around 90% of the weight has been pruned away. And this shows the percentage with respect to, uh, with respect to the whole architecture. And you know that like, uh, or let me ask you, why these uh, why these numbers are too small comparing with these? Can you answer this? Hey, um, so I think it's because the convolutional layers have uh, less weights because they uh, like that's the whole idea they have the small kernel which runs across mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the whole data so there's just there's just less to prune away right right yeah exactly so these um, convolutional layers as you remember comparing with fully connected layer um, has a lot less uh, number of weights right because we do weight sharing right the sharing uh, help to decrease the number of weights. But on the other hand, like what is the cost we pay? Uh, if you want to remind us. I mean, it's just accuracy, I guess, over the more you- uh, No, I mean, more like, you... Uh, comparing the comp layer, uh, what is the difference between fully connected layer and comp layer? beside these number of weights? Less flexibility, I guess. They can't learn nearly as much. Mm, in terms of computation? Oh, well, the convolutional layers um, require less storage. Um, mm -hmm. Computationally, though, do they take less computation i don't recall or believe that you i can't think of why right because, because you do convolution operator right you need to like uh do this convolution over your um input uh, uh map and then produce the output map uh, right so convolution uh if you remember it was somehow um, um you remember we discussed about this 60 um, loop that that we need to um, to do in order to calculate the output. Um, so more computation, uh, but less number of weights to learn uh, and gaining some invariances as a result of the property of convolution. Right. Uh, on the other hand, um, the fully connected, we have a lot more. Uh, weights to a store and access this accessing the memory was expensive uh, but relatively with respect to the uh, conv, uh, we need to do less computation this is much as straightforward but yeah uh, very good point right and that's why comparing with this fully connected you see these are very small right um, but then after you normalize it, you put everything to 100%, meaning that you normalize with respect to the number of weights. Um, uh, so, so you see exactly what's going on per layer. Um, these uh, green stuff showing the part of the uh, weights that you can prune away. As you see, like in your comp layer, you can like remove, um, um, Right, so um, roughly around two thirds uh, of your weights um, and in fully connected uh, layers, you can roughly remove 90% of the weights. That's, that's a kind of result that this paper got. Uh, and in early layers, um, since you need to look at all features in your input, uh, typically you don't want to uh, lose those right um so this means that you don't want to like if you want to compare it with uh 
with human brain, you don't want to uh, basically blind yourself because you want to look at everything. Maybe some surgeon could remove some of your neurons and you can still do some processing, uh, but you don't want to lose your, uh, your eyes, right? Um, this is the way how you can um, correspond it with, um, with these pruning approaches. And for VGG, again, um, another larger architecture or deeper architecture, you see that we have like several uh, conf blocks, right? Much more number of conf layers. Um, so in this case, um, and again, the same, right? You see that you have much more number of weights in, in your fully connected layers. Um, and, and then in total, um, they were able to get rid of 93% uh, of the weights in total. Uh, again, more or less similar comparing with this uh, previous AlexNet um, here around roughly uh, two thirds of, um, of the um, VGD, VGG uh, conf layers and uh, more than or roughly in total around 90% of, of the weights in fully connected layers. That's, that's somehow um, the result that uh, they've got. And again, like there are like numerous work papers um, this, this is a result of one particular paper. Uh, some, uh, and it has some interesting properties. Some, some approaches, model compression approaches, they consider a specific percentage of the weights you want to prune from each layer. So as a result, you would see all of this, like in some papers. Um, so there is no variation in terms of the number of weights. Like, you consider it, I want to prune away like 80% of the weights from each layer, no matter what, right? And this is the approach I, I want to, um, I, I develop, right? Um, this approach consider different um, flexibility in terms of the number of weights, uh, depending on, uh, uh, depending on the threshold that you choose for, uh, for pruning, right? Uh, and the number of uh, retraining uh, you would do uh, as a result. Any question about this? Um, like another sort of result for LSTM architecture or recurrent uh, neural network. Um, you see that, um, so the, um, um, this is, this one, uh, the blue line is without any retraining. You see that it is start losing uh, accuracy um, right away, right? Uh, when going above 50% of the weights. Uh, but with retraining, you see that it preserves um, the same accuracy up to 90%, only start losing a little bit. Uh, when it goes from 90 to 95. Um, so again, if you remember this LSTM architecture were somehow um, similar to fully connected um, networks. Um, this is the way how, how LSTM works, right? Um, more or less similar result uh, with what we have seen. Um, and in this paper, they shown, okay, uh, for example, for uh, for these kind of systems that you use for um, capturing um, basically this, this uh, neural talk architecture uh, based on LSTM uh, generate a caption for each image. Um, this is the caption that was generated with the original uh, um, LSTM uh, neural talk model. This is after it has pruned ninety percent of it, right? Um, so you see that in this case, uh, it generate a basketball player in a white uniform is playing with a ball. Um, after pruning, um, 
this is the difference that you see. So um, it, it replaced the bo a ball with basketball, right? Which is somehow um, even you can consider it even better uh, depending on how you think about this, um, right? Um, in this case, um, it replaced field with area. Um, we can see that um, maybe field in this case is more concrete, uh, area is more generic. Um, but again, it, it really depends how you want to interpret it. The interesting case um, is this case, a soccer player in, the, um, in red is running in the field. In this case, after you prune it, 95% of it, right? Um, a man in a red shirt and a black and white black shirt is running, right? So um, basically you can see that it, it does not capture, um, it does not capture um, um, the context, right? Um, and what context means and or relevant here. Uh, so uh, when you prune, um, like ninety five percent, it is start to lose some of uh, some of the accuracy that it had before, right? And it was showing here, uh, right, um, that the result um, somehow correspond with the uh, actual experiments running on some of the data set. So this this is interesting uh, to provide what it means really on on the uh, on the evaluation and test. Uh, what is the implication uh, of this beyond just accuracy? Also, they reported the speed up um, on different uh, hardware, um, particular CPU and GPU for different uh, uh, neural network, right? Uh, Alex uh, 6, 7, 8, VGG, uh, different kind of architecture, right? Um, this is um, the, um, this one is um, the summary or uh, the average geometric average across all of these. Um, so you can see that um, this one is for CPU. Um, this one is um, CPU when it is pruned, uh, 3x um, on average across all of these architecture uh, when you use pruned on the CPU. Uh, this is pruned on the um, GPU, uh, right? Um, sorry, this is GPU um, dense. Um, this is um, when when you uh, prune it and you deploy it on the GPU. You you run it on the GPU. Forty eight x uh, improvement comparing with uh, basically what you had on CPU. Um, this is in terms of a speed up. So basically this CPU is your baseline. The rest is, um, is a speed up with respect to this baseline. Um, so again, um, this one, um, 3X, um, when you deploy it on the same CPU, but just prune it, um, uh, already with deploying on GPU, you get 15X improvement comparing with um, uh, with CPU and if you prune it, you, you see that it's 48X uh, comparing with the, uh, with the CPU, which is great. Um, but again, um, like um, as I mentioned, there has been work in 1990s. Uh, it's called optimal, optimal brain damage. Um, this is one of the interesting work if some of those those, those of you who wants to go deeper uh, in mathematics uh, and um, gain some insight, this is one of the papers that I would highly recommend uh, if you want to learn more about uh, these uh, model compression approaches. Uh, it's more theoretical and um, uh, mathematical uh, than um, this recent work. But you can associate most um, ideas that come uh, 
out uh, uh, now is, is more or less connected with this uh, foundational work uh, in 1990s. Um, let's also um, talk about quantization, uh, specifically trained quantization that is introduced in this paper. Um, so um, basically uh, quantization again is about uh, representing um, the numbers, uh, represent how, how, uh, how you want to represent your uh, your rates, for example, do you want to use um, floating point representation or integer representation? We discuss about that, like in terms of consequences, number of bits that you require to uh, represent your number, right? Uh, so, in, in computer architecture, for those who already uh, passed it, um, you know what I. Uh, mean exactly, but we discussed it briefly uh, previously in, in, in this course as well. So after you do this pruning, um, you, uh, you reduce it to roughly around 10% uh, uh, of the size uh, with the same accuracy. So here you, you have the same accuracy. And uh, now like with quantization, you can, you can do much better, right? So uh, quantization again is, is um, this is one idea for quantization in this paper, but there are so many other uh, ideas out there, but this is an uh, interesting one. And after you do quantization, you reduce it to 3.7% of, of the size. Uh, so this idea of quantization, um, the interesting part is, is that, um, so in quantization, you know that when, when you, uh, when you uh, reduce floating point uh, to, for example, integer representation, right? Um, to clarify it, let's consider this. Um, so when you, uh, when you uh, reduce uh, uh, your, um, number of the number of bits uh, that you want to consider for representing numbers um, typically um, default is is to uh, use a unified uh, uh, representation right so um, uniform representation right so for example if you have four bits um, to uh, to represent uh, numbers um, you you can represent um, 16 different numbers uh, uniformly distributed um, between two, uh, two intervals, right? Uh, in, in one interval. Um, the idea behind this uh, trend quantization is that maybe we could do better. Maybe we could spend these 16 different values uh, more centered around uh, where these uh, weights are, right? So these are these are the hi histogram uh, of the weights after after you did your uh, after you did your pruning, right? So the original uh, uh, density was probably something like that, right? Um, so this is this is after you trained your network initially. This was probably um, a kind of density function uh, for the original model. Um, the idea uh, for the first step uh, pruning was to get rid of these a small value which are centered around zero, right? After you prune it, um, this is now um, the two modes of, of your density function that are remain, right? So you get rid of a small value. The small values were here. So after you do this, after you do retraining, um, you basically uh, weights have typically multiple modes. In this case, two two particular modes. Um, is this clear for you guys? So this is basically the um, the distribution or density function of the weights um, after after you do uh, pruning. 
Then um, the, the key idea behind train quantization is that maybe if, if you, for example, uniformly distribute your number, uh, your quantized number here, then you wasted this, right? So there is no, there is no weights here. There is no weights here, uh, right? All, all your weights are, are here and here, right? Um, then basically you lose accuracy, right? So if you look at carefully, um, you only, um, how many you have here? Um, let me make it clear for you. So without, so with uniform representation, you have one here, two here, three here, uh, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and four here to, to represent the, uh, the weights for this second mode, right? Uh, but once you do this quantization carefully, you have more numbers within this um, distribution uh, after, with this careful consideration, right? So in particular, we have one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? We have eight different numbers to capture uh, the weight values here. And again, like quantization, like we, like uh, we have only limited value. In this case, we want to use four bits. Uh, so only we have 16, uh, 16 different values to represent and we want to put them carefully uh, where they can capture the most information after quantization, right? Um, in this case also, like you have one, two, three, four, five, six here, yeah, instead of one, two, three, okay? That's, that's a benefit of it, right? You have more numbers uh, to capture this variation because the, the stuff here, the stuff here doesn't matter. There is no weights to represent, right? Uh, with this way, you, you, uh, you basically, you did your quantization much, uh, much controlled and better way. More specifically, um, the way how they do this um, intelligent um, um, way of representing this quantized value is based on um, like some clustering, right? So you have a limited number of uh, numbers to represent, right? So here you have only two bits, right? Uh, with two bits, um, how many? Numbers you can you can show um, four right um, so you have only four numbers that you can uh, you can show uh, and these are the uh, the weights that you get uh, considering thirty two bit uh, floating point okay this is um, this is the weight right. Um, so after you train it with uh, with floating point representation, um, these are the weights that uh, you learn. Then now you want to use your uh, your only four values uh, to represent this this weight, right? Only four values, um, and look at the numbers, right? You have different uh, different numbers, like you have two point nine, you have. Uh, zero point ninety eight. You have this. You have zero, right? Um, and you want to find a way uh, with only four numbers how you want to represent this the best because you want to get as close as possible to these values, to these uh, floating point numbers. Then um, um, what they do is that they they run a k-min. K-min is a clustering uh, approach on the weights, uh, right? These are again, uh, the weights that reside on the, uh, on the kernel. Um, this is basically uh, your kernel. Um, what you do is, is to, um, to consider uh, uh, this clustering. So you have multiple cluster, you have like four cluster. In this case, um, 
with k-min, if if you remember, you needed to um, to say that how many clusters you want to get as a result. In this case, like k-min is the most appropriate clustering because we know exactly how many number how many number of clusters we want to get, and this how many number of clusters depends on. Can anybody say depends on what? I'm waiting on you. How do you know how many clusters we, we want here? By the number of bits that we want to use for quantization. Exactly, right? So the number of bits is two. Um, we know that with two bits, we can represent four numbers. So we have only four clusters, right? So since we know this information, we run k-means with um, four cluster. This is what we get. Um, these are colored, right? Um, so, for example, um, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell uh, is one cluster, right? Um, and then, um, so basically corresponding to the blue. Um, and then you center these two, uh, around two, because most of these are, are around two. Right, this makes sense. And then you have um, this, 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 uh, and these are um, z zero cluster number in cluster index zero. These are cluster index, right? Um, and look at the numbers; they are um, around minus one, right? So you have one uh, cluster with the centroid. Um, uh, of uh, minus one and as accordingly uh, zero and one point half, right? Um, so you have and, and you you have the uh, uh, representation of one point half, right? Um, because you have the flexibility to decide where do you want to put your um, centroid, and then you can uh, you can fine tune uh, your centroid after uh, after you do retraining and so on. Right. Um, so this is the key idea uh, behind um, this um, this interesting way of uh, of doing quantization. Any question about this? And some results. Um, so this is um, showing the accuracy again. Um, um, so um, the x-axis uh, gives the number of bits uh, for uh, for the values, right? Um, and you see that um, it only lose um, a lot of accuracy when you have only one bit, which makes sense, right? You don't want to. This is for fully connected layer. You don't want to have like one bit. If one bit, like you have two numbers to represent, right? Uh, and it would be difficult really to to uh, to gain any accuracy with two two numbers uh, for showing the weights, um, right? Um, for conf layer, even higher, right? Uh, you start losing um, after uh, reducing to below four bits. Um, so this is um, these are some results that you can consider. So essentially, for comp layer, uh, it means that you probably need more uh, more basically quantized uh, values uh, to, to, represent, uh, to represent these uh, bits inside your conf layers. Here are um, results for, um, for pruning uh, and trained quantization when you do both, right? Um, is, um, Red dots, um, and this is the case when only pruning, right? Um, 
and this is quantization only. Uh, and SVD is, uh, is another uh, way of doing uh, uh, model compression that they compared against. And you see that um, pruning and quantization uh, basically improve the uh, results. So the x-axis shows the model size ratio after compression. Um, you see that um, it is able to, um, so if you go this way, the better, um, and this is the accuracy loss. So you can, you can reduce with pruning and quantization, you really can reduce it, um, reduce your model size somewhere around even 2% of the original size and not gain, not lose any accuracy. Right, uh, with uh, we reach with only pruning or quantization, you you were not able to do that, right? Uh, but if you combine them both together, um, as they have done here, right? So meaning that you do first pruning, uh, you do retraining uh, multiple times, right? And then you do quantization and combine it um, as a pipeline, um, it, it works really well, right? So um, you, reduce, um, you reduce your model size for quite a bit uh, without losing any accuracy. And, and some of the um, other um, results uh, with respect to different uh, model architecture, and this is showing the compression rate um, and um, different uh, error metrics, top one um, and top five. Uh, and by the way, like top five um, basically is, is the accuracy when the top five label that is uh, predicted by the network is among the true, uh, uh, the true label in ground truth data, then it counts one example that as labeled as true, even it is not the top one. Um, so that's the difference between top one and top five, if, if you haven't discussed it earlier. So you see that um, like both in terms of top five error and top one error, um, um, the error are really comparable um, after you do um, this this number of this compression, and it means that um, like you see the difference in terms of size, right? Um, and if you go all the way to VGG, like VGG is a, a large model that if you want to store it, it, it is like um, 500 megabyte, uh, which is relatively large. After you do uh, compression, it's only 11 uh, megabyte. So, if if you if you do this model compression, imagine like what what would it mean, right? Think about what would it mean if if you use if you want to use VGG for like let's say uh, image prediction of like an app that predict what is this particular plot, right? You deploy it on, you develop an app, right? Uh, for predicting, showing uh, with your camera on your mobile device, what is this plant and it predicts, okay, this is this particular plant, right? For plant type uh, prediction. Um, if you want to use VGG, means that with your app, you need to bundle um, a model that is sized uh, over 500 megabyte and you want to push it in your in the app in for example um, at the app store of iphone right apple um, so everybody that wants to use this app needs to download 500 megabyte first of all there are some restrictions on the size of app and uh, some limitation on that. Uh, uh, 
if in the first place you and some of the devices like for example you cannot use it in your watch because typically watches have less memory than this right uh, so there would be so many and vgg relatively comparing with even newer models is is a small relatively right uh has been one of the largest model like a few years ago but now relatively even is a small so if you are able to compress it and gain and not lose any accuracy that would be the way to go and why it is important for modern applications so um yeah, um, you can you can compress um, complex um, um, deep neural network, um, and it has a lot of benefit uh, for uh, energy consumption, uh, for um, a storage, um, the kind of you know application you can develop with, um, and specifically this is important for like. Um, again, like model compression might not be relevant at all. Like if if you have like a model and you want to do like just prediction, maybe <laughs> why you care about like model compression, but specifically for uh, machine learning systems, right? Um, this is very important because of all of the restrictions that you have uh, for ML systems uh, and you want to um, you want to, um, both in terms of inference and training, you want to uh, decrease the energy consumption, decrease the inference time, decrease the number of computation and the storage that you have. So yeah, um, that's it. I stop here. Um, do you have any question? If not, yeah, um, have a good day. Uh, good luck with your project. Um, and yeah, um, let us know if, if you are struggling with, um, with your project. It's, uh, I hope I haven't seen any discussion on GitHub uh, lately. Uh, I've been uh, busy with the deadline um, that I have this Thursday, but I will try to catch up um but i talked with um uh your ta um so um yeah ying said that um everything is all right apparently but let us know sounds good thanks bye